So I will be talking about uh, in hospital management of hyperglycemia, and my focus is on critical case settings. Mister. Sir, Dr. Pratap, we have only about 10 minutes. Yeah, I will complete in seven minutes, sir. So this is mainly based on our own RSSDI clinical practice recommendations released in 2016 regarding in-hospital management of hyperglycemia where Dr. Sanjay Agrawal, Dr. Salini Jaggi, Dr. Vijay Panikar sir and team has prepared this draft. This is very useful for our routine clinical practice. So we all know that hyperglycemia and ICU mortality, we all know that in ICUs, critical care settings, presence of hyperglycemia is directly linked with increased mortality and increased complications. And the targets, as already highlighted, it is 140 to 180 in ICU settings. And almost all in hospital hyperglycemia management, the focus is to keep blood sugar between 140 to 180. This is the, uh, you have to use IV insulin protocol and this is how to start insulin infusion, how to adjust what are the recommendations for the limited care setting? And there is also an app by RSSDI for the same that I will touch upon in my presentation. So whenever the blood sugar is more than 180, then you have to begin with insulin initiation in critical care settings. And your target is to keep between 140 to 180. There are select cases where you are able to target between 110 to 140 without increasing the risk of hypoglycemia, particularly in cardiac surgical patients, then it is preferable. Otherwise, our target is to keep between 140 to 180, never go beyond 180, and the glucose should not go below 110 in critical care settings. Variety of protocols are there, but you have to have your own protocol adapted to your own institution, your own staff, your own team. So insulin infusion, uh, when you want to prepare that with the help of an insulin infusion pump, 50 units of regular insulin is dissolved in 50 ml of normal saline in an infusion pump. Initially, 50 to 20 ml, you have to flush through plastic tubing to saturate the insulin binding sites in the tubing. And then you have to start the infusion depending on the blood sugar values which are there. Whatever the blood sugar value is there, that has to be divided by 100, and that will give you the initial infusion rate for uh, beginning of intravenous insulin infusion. If blood sugar is more than 300, you may give a priming bolus of regular insulin that is 0.1 unit per kg body weight. Uh, many centers, they do not prefer bolus, this priming bolus, they straight away start with infusion and then adjust the rate of infusion to bring the glucose in the range uh, very slowly rather than very steeply. So once you have started insulin, the rate adjustment is to be done by doing capillary blood glucose monitoring one hourly. And you have to look at the current capillary blood glucose, the previous capillary blood glucose, the rate at which the blood glucose is coming down or going up, and the current rate of infu insulin infusion. And accordingly, then you have to change the infusion. So if the blood glucose is increasing from the previous blood glucose values, then you have to increase the infusion dose by any means. If blood glucose decrease is less than 30 milligram per hour, then you have to increase infusion dose. But when the blood glucose decreases more than 30, generally it is between 30 to 50 milligram, that is accepted as a rate of decrease with infusion. So if blood glucose decreases more than 300, 30 milligram per hour, then you have to continue same infusion dose till the blood glucose comes between 140 to 180 range. So this is the chart which generally we keep in ICUs and we train our staff to go through this chart whenever they are managing intravenous infusion uh, in critically ill settings. So this will show you that when the target is there and if the blood glucose is increasing, then you have to increase the rate. But if blood glucose is decreasing, then you have to decrease the rate by 25%. As Dr. Juvin sir has already highlighted, you have to anticipate hypoglycemia and you have to reduce the rate so that you avoid hypoglycemia happening in critical care setting because that is very detrimental for such critically ill patients. There is a hypoglycemia protocol also whenever blood glucose goes below 70, then you have to suspend insulin and you have to give 25% dextrose and the value is determined based on your 40 milligram percentage. If blood glucose is 40, then you have to minus 100 minus 40, that will give you 60 and that you have to multiply by 0.8. That will give you a, to, uh, you a value of 48 ml 
of IV 25% dextrose. So based on this formula, you can calculate how much dextrose 25% you have to give to correct hypoglycemia. Once blood glucose goes above 70, then you have to monitor every 50 minutes till the blood glucose reaches 90, and then you have to monitor every 30 minutes, and you have to wait till the blood glucose goes above 140. Up till that time, you have not to start infusion. When the blood glucose crosses 140, you may restart the infusion at 50% of the rate at the time when hypoglycemia occurred. There is an app to support this, and you can use this app very well in critical care settings for insulin dose adjustment. This app is being prepared by RSSDA. Now, it is not that you have to continue with infusion in critical care settings all the time. When the patient is stable or being shifted to a uh, lower care or patient started taking regular meals, then you can transition them to subcutaneous insulin with or without AODs. Most, most of the time, it is only subcutaneous insulin. And as already highlighted, it is basal, nutritional, and correctional insulin that you have to use. And in hospital settings, most of the time, it is basal and nutritional with the help of correctional that you can maintain blood glucose in the range of 140 to 180. One important thing whenever you are shifting from intravenous insulin infusion to subcutaneous insulin, you have to overlap. If you are using a regular insulin or rapid acting insulin analog, you have to continue that drip for at least one hour, two hour after giving that first pre-cop subcutaneous insulin. And if you are using a long-acting insulin analog, then after first pre-cop long-acting insulin analog, you may need to continue this drip for two to three hours because the IV insulin half-life is very low. So when you want to shift from intravenous insulin infusion to this uh, basal bolus or basal nutritional correctional insulin, that is BNC insulin, you have to calculate the amount of insulin which was being transfused in last six hours, suppose it is 10 units, then you have to multiply it by four, that will give you a 24 hour insulin requirement of 40 units, and you have to make 80% of that 24 hour insulin requirement. So 80% of total daily dose, that is 32 units. So 32 unit is your total daily dose, of which 50% will be basal, and 50% will be bolus. If you are using a long-acting insulin analog like Glargin, you have to give uh, that to 50% dose at OD dose, and if you are using NPH, then you have to give at, it as BD dose. So Glargin either 16 or NPH or 88, and 50% bolus is to be divided in three equal doses uh, between three meals, and if you are using salt-acting regular insulin or analog, then it is 555. So this patient who was on insulin infusion, his total daily de uh, dose requirement was 32, and he was shifted to this kind of basal and uh, nutritional insulin. Ultimately, it is a team approach in hospital management of hyperglycemia. Not only uh, the diabetologist is there, but the entire team requires an integrated approach. Your nursing staff, your diabetes educator, and everybody should be in sync with each other so that we can improve the care of these people in critical care as well as non-critical care settings. Thank you very much.